We have been working on this report for many years. Um, its genesis was in the, our initial reporting on vacancy rates using water data as a water usage data as a proxy. And what we started to understand was while we were able to measure vacant dwellings, we were unable to account for the many um, hectares of approved lots on in the greenfields um, with that with that vacancy uh, data. So we started trying to figure out how we might go about measuring that. And working with um, Dr. Cameron Murray from the University of Sydney, Carl has um, been squirreling away at this report for a number of years now. I won't steal any more of his thunder, um, but I will introduce you to him. And this is a very, very special and important um, night for Prosper. Carl Fitzgerald has been in our organization for 18 years and this is his mic drop um, moment. <laughs> this is his last report for Prosper. He is moving on to greener pastures, literally greener pastures, trying to organize the uh, CLT or community land trust movement here in Australia so that we can start having uh, community-based non-market um, responses to our housing affordability crisis. So with no more further ado, take it away, Carl. Thanks very much, Emily. Yes, great to be with you. And uh, yeah, before we get uh, into it any further, um, I'd like to pay my respects to uh, uh, the elders past, present and emerging of the, the Wurundjeri people here in Melbourne and up to uh, the Jaja Warren people in central Victoria, uh, where I wrote this report staring out onto my beautiful uh, land up there. My, can I say the word my? No, our beautiful land, because we are all custodians uh, of this beautiful earth. And that's the sort of um, philosophy that underpins some of the sort of geeky language that we use. Um, and often I get a few uh, eye rolls when I say it, but um, uh, I, I often say that, um, uh, the following three letters are the white man's word for sharing, and it is T-A-X, tax reform. And uh, today uh, we're talking about how we can enact uh, the sort of hot potato tax that is uh, a penalty for sitting on land that is not being utilised uh, effectively. And that's what uh, the stage releases report is looking at, because as Emily said, We've done this uh, speculative vacancies report uh, for 13 odd years, but for about the last 10, I've been trying to get this report up. So a big thanks to Dr. Cameron Murray, who did the hard yards churning through all the numbers. Uh, yeah, we, we ummed and art on so many factors with this report, but uh, yeah, we're really happy with how it's turned out and uh, looking forward to bringing it to you tonight. Can I get this to work, Jesse? Okay, so the overview. We looked at uh, nine master plan communities uh, on the Eastern Seaboard, uh, some 26,000 sales, uh, huge, huge spreadsheets, you know, absolutely incredible. Uh, Cam using uh, R as the program to an analyze it. And the, uh, the time span, whoops, was from, this is an incorrect, Jesse, 2001 to 2020 uh, was the, the total uh, report period we looked at there. So um, yeah, the oldest uh, uh, development that we studied was uh, the monster that is Springfield near Ipswich in Queensland, uh, Manor Lakes in Wyndham in uh, Western Melbourne uh, was the next oldest uh, development. But on average, uh, they, they had been in production for nine and a half years. But what was surprising, and you know, I've really, I have noticed people's jaws drop when they see that after nine and a half years, uh, 110,000 lots, uh, these nine master plan communities had under control, 76.2% uh, of the land bank remained vacant. 
So they are monstrous numbers. And uh, yeah, it really was um, quite an eye opener to see that so much land was being sat on. And uh, you know, because of that, uh, the average across the, the nine master plan communities was a, a total development time of 40 years, not the expected 20. But I imagine uh, Victorian and New South Wales developers are probably scratching their heads and maybe even punching the wall saying, this is just not true. And I will say to them, perhaps you are right, because it is the laggards in the north in Cam Murray's uh, home state of Queensland that have blown out the averages. New South Wales uh, developers we studied uh, uh, were, were on track to finish their development at 20 years. Victoria, a little bit slower at 25, but in Queensland, the three big developments there, 65 years is how slowly they're going to actually sell the developments uh, over time. So um, they've really blown our stats out. And uh, yeah, we, you know, there's so many different angles with this report to analyze. And uh, Cameron brought to our attention that hidden away in Queensland is a little loophole that uh, if you're a developer with uh, X amount of land sites vacant in your development pipeline, you get a land tax discount. So of course, they've blown out to 64, 65 years. We need that hot potato tax in place so that uh, supply comes onto the market more rapidly. So uh, with that, the average uh, amount of the approved lots that came through was 3.4% uh, uh, per annum across all of uh, the developments. Well, so Willowdale was a very interesting one. And uh, let's just explain this graph. You can see the legend along the bottom. We have in orange, the average land price per square meter. And these are moving averages over three months across the, the land price and uh, the observed sales in gray. But in blue in the background is the total land bank. And see on the left there it starts at 100 percent and by the time uh, you get to January 2020 on the right hand side uh, we have 43.63 percent of Willowdale's um, supply left. Now Willowdale is based in uh, I think southwestern Sydney um, and uh, the interesting thing with this development is that they uh, are actually selling at a rate of knots and it looks like they'll be um, completed uh, in 11.4 years. So they're selling very quickly, but you can see there that um, uh, through 2013 to 15, there were, um, you know, average sort of sales, nothing too special. Uh, but then as the market started to heat up in August, 2015, all the way through to 16 and up to about April 2017, we saw big, big uh, sales numbers there, you know, big. Uh, but uh, we're looking at uh, something like 50 odd lots sold um, a month. Uh, and you can see in orange that prices increased um, in that period, uh, Feb 20, uh, sorry, June 2015, up to uh, October 2015, uh, you know, the market was uh, building up nicely. But then, you know, the big question is uh, prices kept increasing over time, even though all this supply was coming onto the market. So uh, what we saw in Willowdale was that um, with uh, the average supply rates across all of the de developments at 3.4%. Willowdale was running at 8.1%, but still prices over this period from October 2013 to Jan 2020 increased by 6.5% a year above inflation. So what we're saying is this is the best case example of um, supply in action in our study, but still it didn't make a dent on pricing. 
So uh, yeah, you know, you scratch your head and there's quite a lot of head scratching to do when you do read the 58 page report um, because not all of the um, outcomes are what you would expect. We've got a lot to learn in this space. There's obviously a lot of issues that affect every single um, development that are different. Uh, we can't have it. We don't have answers for all of them, but I'll show you something uh, towards the end of this presentation that will get you really thinking about what's going on. So Woodley, based uh, in Melbourne, uh, Rock Bank uh, in the Shire of uh, Mountain South. We can see here in 2015, these guys started off with a bang and they sold very quickly through 2015 and became Australia's fastest master plan community. And uh, I was living in the West at the time uh, in Braybrook, uh, going around the Western Ring Road and there were always signs out saying, this is Australia's fastest growing community. It's like, wow, this is really exciting. There were news reports out, um, people were lined up around the corner trying to get access to these sites and they keep selling out. Wow, what a great development. You know, out of all of the projects we studied, this was the one that had the best social media feed. You know, they really seem like they care, doing good things. Um, but yeah, have a look at that orange line. It keeps going up and up and up. And uh, what we found was that uh, in the first two years of this development, they sold something like, th they sold 13.8% of their stock. So they sold pretty quickly, but in the three years following, have a look at those gray lines there. Um, yeah, we've got falling supply levels. So over the next three years, uh, they only sold 6.8% of the supply, but prices, as we see, kept increasing, something like 16.5% on average per annum. So the people of Woodley, what do you think? You know. We make a, a line in our, um, in our press release that, and in the report that uh, first home buyers were lured into master plan communities on the promise that supply would make a difference. But here we have another example of a master plan community that is uh, uh, ratcheting up supply, but also able to lean to price growth. So what's going on here? And, you know, it's what people have been sitting around this table here at Prosper Australia have been saying for 130 plus years. It's, it's the land, it's the monopoly power, the market power of those who control our housing opportunities. And we're all about rebalancing these advantages so that uh, those who uh, own a business or, uh, you know, work for a living um, have similar opportunities to those who own land. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's hard to keep up with the land story. It just keeps growing and growing. So we've got to look at it from all angles and we're hoping that this report will help bring out um, a new perspective. So Jordan Springs, another one in Western Sydney. You can see at the start there, uh, March 2010, it opens up, supply is pretty low. Uh, but Watch the orange line, it keeps growing and growing and growing, doesn't it? Doesn't really drop, but we see supply um, uh, peaking up until June, December 2014 into March 2015, supply starts to uh, wind back. Um, September 2015, yeah, it's, it's you know, 50, 60% drop on uh, just six, 12 months earlier. So uh, yeah, big supply drops there, but prices keep increasing. And uh, look through to uh, mid-2017, and there's another big supply cutback, um, but uh, prices keep increasing. And by the end of 2017, um, you know, this, this development actually is very interesting because uh, if you look at what happens from September 2018 onwards, it's the only development in our study where supply um, sort of dawdles along, but prices actually fall. 
And you look at that and go, geez, what actually happened? Did supply, did it work? What happened? Well, it turns out that uh, Lendlease, the developer, probably fired someone there because uh, they set up uh, a huge portion of this development on sinking land. And so 800 property owners were offered uh, millions of dollars in compensation to sort of hush it up. But uh, basically supply um, was wound back from 2018 because there was so much media in the city press talking about this problem. So, you know, again, you know, we can see that supply uh, had its oscillations, but really made no impact at all on price. So, uh, yeah, Jordan Springs, um, a bit of a, an outlier in terms of, of our um, study because of that uh, sinking land issue. But I still think it shows a story because of the fact that supply really didn't have an impact on prices and you just have to wonder why that occurred. So uh, back to Victoria and apologies to Queensland, we still haven't got there, but we are going to. Um, yeah, Atherston was uh, a development that is unique in the study because um, over this time period, what is very interesting is that the initial offering price appears to be affected by this puny amount of supply. So prices actually dropped and have a look all the way along some five, six years until the price gets back above the initial offering um, land price. Now that is unique. You could argue this supply actually made a difference. But if we look up here, we can see that, you know, probably at 92, 93% here, maybe down to 90% by now, there's still 90% of the land bank left um, and prices are moderating. So we're kind of like, wow, I wonder why they had this slow um, release and were willing to accept this low price growth. What was going on? Uh, we come into this boom period of uh, uh, 16 into 17, prices really take off as um, interest rates uh, throw people into the market, cut back again. Uh, you know, crazy how many times interest rates have been cut since uh, 2012. Uh, you'd think with record low employment, high economic growth, we wouldn't have needed all these interest rate cuts. But, you know, the Australian economy has been so uh, weak in generating its own growth. We've effectively replaced our manufacturing sector with uh, housing construction. And so anything um, and everything is thrown at real estate to keep this uh, great employment plan. Uh, provider growing, but uh, yeah, we see as the market really takes off in 16 into 17, the prices go absolutely through the roof. And uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, quite a phenomenon. We're like, what, an actu what actually happened here? Well, it turns out that there were public announcements happening around this time that in late 2019, the taxpayers of Victoria were gifting a new, probably three or four hundred million dollar train station to this development. So, um, Cobble Bank train station opened up in 2019. Uh, see here, sales really you know, didn't increase. A lot of uncertainty with the Royal Bank Commission and uh, uh, lending rates, uh, access to credit, those sort of things. So perhaps they were just waiting, sitting on the supply, uh, you know, 70, 70 odd percent of supply still left, waiting for um, the market to settle down, the new train station to come in, probably a whole pile of new employment in the area as well. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I wish I had uh, thousands of dollars to buy the data again to see what's happened last couple of years, but uh, I'd be expecting that these supply rates are now really starting to pick up and uh, they're benefiting from uh, this, uh, this beautiful infrastructure gift that the 
Victorian taxpayers have given um, the residents of Atherstone. So, uh, yeah, now um, this, this was uh, our lead graph, figure one in the report, and we're talking about total average sales to land prices. Uh, sales are in orange, land price in blue. And uh, what I wanted to point out was that, uh, yeah, for the, this period between 2014 to um, 2014, to uh, 17, the price would oscillate, but it's reasonably consistent. Uh, but in mid 2017, the, um, the supply rate, the sales rate drops by across all nine developments by 48.7%. So this is massive. And that's a two-year average, 48.7%. But as you can see, the majority of that drop happened within just a couple of months. Um, so what is also of note is why these sales really dropped away. Look what happened to prices. They kept heading upwards. So here we see again market power in play. And this is really the strength of our argument with the stage release story is what's happening right here, right now, um, because developers often say, look, this report is, you know, I woke up on Sunday morning and apparently the uh, property lobby had somehow heard that this report was being written up by Cara Waters at the age. And they'd already decided it was based on a flawed analysis, hadn't been released, hadn't read it. So you can imagine I got a little bit fired up by, uh, my Sunday morning thinking of that. And, um, yeah, you know, but they're like, look, the planning takes a long time. You know, we need to get our, our, uh, our uh, planning subdivision, our map of uh, subdivision organized, all of the infrastructure trunk work, all of that established. And we know that does take time. You know, it's 18 months delayed for the developers. But you know, no doubt they already all of that in place here across all nine developments did they all just run into this giant thicket of red tape that strangled them so what happened so what first home buyers are saying around the country well i think what happened really was that um and i'm a bit of a slack here but i'm gonna can i just do a bit of on the fly zoom search through the um search through my uh, beautiful folder structure here and pull up a nice graph. Come on, it's gonna come, it's gonna come. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, no, I, had, I thought I was clever there, but I'm, oh, there we go. I can show it on my screen. You can just see it in the background, those on Zoom, sorry about that. Um, so this is uh, CoreLogic's weekly clearance rate. And uh, here we are, mid-17. And look, the clearance rate drops. And it's probably around about here that uh, the algorithm starts saying, hang on a minute, clearance rates across the country are starting to fall. We've got issues. And, uh, you know, we don't need hushed meetings anymore. It's just, uh, it's all about the algorithms. And uh, yeah, that, that would have told the developers, look, it's time guys, we've got to protect our bottom line. We know if land prices fall, our financiers are going to let right in the demand and margin, pull the margin call on us and we're going to have to make that guy uh, with this falling land rate. So, uh, yeah, we think that whilst developers you know, are critical of the uh, uh, planning framework and the delays there, we'd actually love to see them raising, raising concerns about the way that uh, the bank industry enjoys the good times as uh, land prices increase, because every time the land goes up in value on their books, uh, that the developers developing. Um, 
their basically able to create more credit. So when land prices fall, they have to write down the book, they can't lend out that credit. We all know the flow on effect that has to small business, but importantly, that person may be one of the places for the bank district. So um, there's a lot to learn from this graph, and uh, yeah, we will have to um, uh, keep discussing this because, yeah, you know, we'd love to hear from the, from the housing industry what their side of the story is. As you know, in December 2017, that's when the Royal Bank was working. You know, credit card difficult after that, but a lot of it came up at the forum. David. Oh, is it? Thank you. Good feedback. Um, okay, next slide. We're on to Springfield. Finally, we get to Queensland. This is the monster. The biggest development in our um, in our study, uh, forty three thousand odd lots, and uh, on their current um, average supply time frame, it's going to take eighty four years to complete this development. And have a look at that orange line, my friends. What is happening to prices with forty three thousand lots? Can we see prices reducing for, you know, even a couple of uh, you know, three, six months? Very, very rare for that to actually occur. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a concern that uh, this has been going on now for nearly well, over 20 years. And, uh, yeah, they still had 77% of their land supply left. So. Um, yeah, would have been better to have clearer data in Queensland. Very easy to find the precinct structure plans in Victoria to get the total lots approved. But Queensland, um, we went off what they were talking about on the website um, and uh, developed the lot numbers there. Um, so you can see the interesting thing about Springfield is that it is the oldest development in our um, in our study, and we can see actually two, two cycles. Um, we can see the big build up in 02, 04, huge supply coming through here to get the whole community established. Um, 07, 08, uh, you know, the RUD uh, handouts, uh, saving off the GFC, we saw that the prices were, were moderating, but they had come up a plateau. Um, you know, I'd love to see some of these uh, stock market uh, analysts, you know, they have all the different uh, uh, pricing um, trajectories that happen. It feels like, uh, you know, they've reached a new plateau here and, and on go prices. But um, yeah, we can see 2007, eight um, supply increasing and then a supply crunch and prices seem to head up a bit. They're locked into this new higher level. Um, and coming through to 2017, um, supply dropped a little bit there in the middle, but there was a bit of extra lag going on. So we wanted to actually see, you know, what would happen if supply was, um, didn't drop here in 2018, 19. What would have happened if that supply had have been uh, maintained here at some uh, uh, 50 lots plus a month. And um, yeah, we based uh, this calculation, thanks to Jesse Hermans, did his hard yards here, doing some calcs for us, um, on uh, a typical um, elasticity of, uh, of supply um, that the construction industry often uses. We found that um, prices would have actually gone down if supply had been maintained over this time. So um, yeah, that was a, uh, you know, a very interesting um, uh, analysis that we kind of wish we could have done across the whole report, but you know, it's such a big report to write this one. So that, uh, yeah, we use a conservative demand elasticity of minus 0.26 for the constructions of, of dwellings. 
Um, and so land prices would not have risen by the 21.4% we saw over the two years to January 2020. Instead, land prices would have potentially edged lower by 2.32%, as we see uh, with this um, uh, green line here. So in total, that might have um, delivered a 23.73% saving to home buyers if the supply had been maintained during weaker market conditions. So, you know, this is where the rubber hits the road. How are we actually going to get all of this supply to make a difference? Uh, you know, here in Victoria, we've concreted over half our peri-urban um, uh, land in the last decade, but still land prices have increased by some 63% in real terms. So the cost to the environment, to our future sustainability, all sorts of things are being ignored by um, not focusing in close enough on what happens behind the land supply curtain. So Manor Lakes, this was actually the, um, the master plan community that inspired this whole report. Back in, uh, back in 2011-12, uh, uh, we made this documentary called Real Estate for Ransom. We were out there filming lots and uh, looking at the big sales board there and there they were at something like, I think it was stage 137 or something. Here we are another 10 years later, at something like stage 173C but that's within perhaps another whole um, uh, estate. Uh, there's one there called Lollipop Hill and a couple of others they've got, and they break each, each of these mini estates up and sell them using these master plan communities, so uh, using these stage releases. So, uh, yeah, this one is interesting again because you see here this... Uh, nine ten period lots of first home buyers grant record immigration huge huge demand and supply increase uh to meet that but of course didn't really make a dent prices kept moving upwards then uh in mid 2012 was the depths of the global financial crisis in terms of real estate here in victoria and again we can see supply um, the sales there plummeted, um, but yet prices didn't really fall. They kept going. So, uh, yeah, supply again built up as things got better through 15, 16, 17, into 18, still managed to keep going. Um, and then the supply cut back, but look at prices. They ramped right, right up. So, uh, yeah, after 16 years, they've still got 43% of the land supply left. And um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's having a huge effect on home buyers because all the way along, uh, you know, the initial offering uh, lot price uh, has not fallen. It's just kept going upwards and upwards. And, you know, it's taken us 20 years to actually raise a question on this. Uh, and you know, the thing we found so staggering was that there's just no record of public officials, whether bureaucrats, MPs, opposition, uh, MPs, uh, anyone asking questions on why the supply agenda has really been such a dismal letdown for first home buyers who were promised so much by it. So yeah. We're getting to uh, the end of the show. Um, in summary, you know, the slower they go, it seems the more they make. 84,000 lots still sit idle. Right? Will there be any ramifications from this report? Will we see the ACCC answer my emails and accept uh, a meeting to discuss this? Uh, will the newly formed National Housing Supply Council actually bother to look behind the land supply curtain? 
uh, will any housing minister in the country actually pick up the phone and give us a call and say, look, we've got all of these economists on 150K, but none of them have picked out what you and Cameron Murray have done. What about the treasurers? No, they know this is a job creator, but they should also know that with every dollar extra we spend on real estate, that money is going to the people who promised supply would matter. And it's not being spent in local communities, it's not creating uh, jobs, not creating employment. Uh, small business owners are struggling because uh, now we've got these rising interest rates, no one's got headroom to support their local economy. So, you know, we can't blame the developers all the way along. I mentioned the banks before, and uh, I was reminded of this flicking through some photos recently. This is an example of exactly what happens. Uh, botanicals uh, up in the north uh, of the Hume area. Um, this was a site that, uh, the, I'm going to say infamous. Well, they're going to be known over time. The Kelkolo sisters, whose father bought three or 400 acres up there in the 70s, they've held on to it and uh, they got the beautiful rezoning windfall and uh, made a mere $300 million. Free tax, but, you know, with some fancy accounting, that's a nice little windfall there. And uh, you know, Prosper is very happy that we helped uh, implement the rezoning windfall gains tax um, that will capture the next generation of land bankers. So it's not gonna do much for another five, seven years really until uh, the next generation of, of sprawl kicks into play. Um, but you know, this is another problem that uh, developers have to face. They face these middlemen who uh, you know, sit, sit around uh, with their big maps and look at where the demographic growth is, where the big infrastructure projects are. Goodness me, where climate change is gonna push everyone. And they're there buying those sites and waiting for developers to come knocking on their door in another 10 or 15 years and pay this huge asking price to them. So developers, we understand that pressure. We understand you also have to pay the worst infrastructure charging system you could imagine. Uh, you know, instead of infrastructure charges um, being paid for through municipal bonds and then the next 20 years worth of ratepayers repaying that to um, the local council, uh, the GAIC tax is just thrown on the mortgage um, and this generation of home buyers has to pay interest on that and then it's passed on down the line. So, you know, we understand there's a lot of problems with it, but this land banking story is one that's just doesn't receive anywhere near enough attention. So the banks, how could we come up with uh, a system to, to lean in on the banks and the social contract they have? This license to print money, based on rising land values, how can we come to some agreement with a round table with uh, Philip Lowe? How could we actually discuss a fairer way to share the pressures of falling land prices and its impact on credit creation? Uh, it's a pretty massive story, that one, and no one discusses that, but that's what we do here at Prosper Australia. Just mentioned, stop the land banking middlemen. That's what's got to happen. Really, um, rezoning windfall gains tax should have been 75%, should have been set up here in Victoria to capture all the windfalls around this ridiculous suburban rail loop. Uh, but yeah, at least now two jurisdictions, the ACT and Victoria, have some form of rezoning windfall gains tax. Now, the big one, and uh, you know, this is um, an element of this hot potato tax I talked about is something that uh, needs a lot more policy development. But uh, here I am on my last presentation for um, Prosper. And I think it's something that needs a lot more policy work. 
it's an incremental land tax. Give them five years to produce 25% of supply. And if they fail that, um, you know, then land taxes start increasing here. So, you know, I think that would give some sort of target for developers to meet. Um, but, you know, the fact is, even in uh, New South Wales, where, you know, they're meeting their 20 year obligation of, meet, of, of completing these developments, as we saw on Willowdale, delivering 8% a year uh, of their land supply, prices still increased by 6.5%. So there's a lot of work to do in this space, um, but it's a thought starter that needs further exploration. Uh, and lastly, uh, we need third market alternatives. The for profit uh, master plan community model doesn't really seem to stack up when we consider all of the challenges they have, but uh, community land trusts are something uh, that has really taken off in the Northern Hemisphere where the UK has gone from uh, two community land trusts in 2008 to in some uh, circles, they're talking about 500 having um, developed uh, or in the process of development. And it's a way of pulling land out of the speculative market and keeping the gains uh, to share amongst that community so that after seven, 10 years of paying off their debts, they can start investing that money in either more affordable housing or uh, uh, social ventures uh, that the community wants to investigate. In. So that's a little segue into um, my next uh, uh, reiteration, uh, my, my new career path, um, helping to uh, establish community land trusts in Australia. And uh, I'm you know, really excited to be working with uh, some of the best academics and advocates around the country um, uh, in this space. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to having many more conversations uh, in this space. So, yeah, in total, um, the, the quantification of, uh, of this sort of supply, tra this scarcity trap that's been enacted, um, you know, it appears that home buyers and families are paying something like an extra $194,000 um, higher lot prices. So, uh, with that, I think, um, yeah, we'll uh, open it up to Q&A. Anyone got some questions? I can repeat it. I've um, spoken to um, the speaker. Yes, Rory, yes. Rory Costello, yes. great guy. Yeah. 
We better bring you up, Ben. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to uh, going to be able to replay that. But basically, you're saying, look, there is common sense in this development model because they need to have land no, on no, tap. No, I don't. That's that's their what you argue. Right? Okay. What I also think is going on is so your graphs really beautifully show how they front end land deleted. They meet some of their disposal yeah. obligations to the state and local councils. And then they pull back and then they allow price to increase and then they deplete out the property at an increased price. So they, they make an initial kind of average return, but then they make bigger returns as the stage release has gone. So Definitely returns to their shareholders. Mm. So, no, they're playing with that. Yeah. Ooh. They're playing wow. With that. RMIT uh, lecturer, academic, yeah. Bento, is, you're putting it, you agree what we're saying, Absolutely. this hypothesis is Absolutely. what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, they don't need to have these meetings, you know, in, they might have their uh, long Friday lunches, I'm sure they do. And, they don't need to discuss prices. They don't need to discuss uh, stage releasing rates. They just probably make sure they have similar algorithms. So they're all getting similar data sources and the messages will be coming through loud and clear. They don't always, from my knowledge, talk together, but the reason why I know Commonwealth of State Bank of whatever the state is, you need to touch this hot potato is because it is really stable. The Australian economy is now so dependent upon the property industry and sector that anybody who is willing to touch this, like Peter Shorten at the previous federal election, proposed some, some amendments to um, capital gains tax and also to um, negative gearing. That caused the most reaction. So there's too much at stake here because we don't know. Don't, don't you think, though, that if Shorten hadn't have taken on franking credits, he might have got somewhere? Yes. You know, that was yeah. the big danger. And that's what worries me, that that gets lost in this concern, this Keating-esque concern that you can't touch property. I think enough families in you know, uh, middle-class uh, electorates are sick of having their kids living at home to their mid-20s that they may well be willing to accept some changes to the tax code to, to give their kids a chance. Absolutely. And I think the idea of an incremental land tax on developers is a brilliant idea. The only problem is if it ever comes into existence, it will only be passed on to the first time buyers who want to move up and to the state. Well, the, the, our retort to that would be, well, look, it's going to actually encourage more competition because more, more supply will come on the market. From that, we will see prices head downwards. Um, you know, I wish that we could broaden our land tax base so that all of those living in big, drafty homes, Ratley homes would sell them. Uh, anyone with a spare bedroom would recognise, gee, I better get some uh, renters in here and we'd get a bit more competition. Uh, but yeah. Uh, have we got any other questions from our Zoom audience, Jesse? The main thing that we would like to know is what was the last question? Because we didn't hear any of that. You couldn't hear Bento at all. We couldn't hear Bento at all. Oh, shit. So if you could just briefly summarise what the previous question was, that would be very nice for the people in the Zoom room. Oh, I am sorry. Um, yeah, it was as my battery comes to um, precarious low, low levels. Um, uh, Bento was basically agreeing that um, developers do uh, front end their developments and uh, then slow down and make... Uh, a nice tidy return as uh, land prices increase and no doubt infrastructure gifts have been rolled out in place. But he did also say that our friend uh, Rory Costello at Villawood, one of the best, uh, most friendliest developers I've ever met, really nice guy, he's, you know, said that, look, it just makes practical sense to have land on tap so that we can do all this heavy lifting through planning, through all the trunk infrastructure that um, needs to be put in place. So um, 
Yeah, good to hear both sides of uh, the story there. I'm Jesse. Can you stand up and speak yeah. into this? Yes. Um, uh, do you think the current super low interest rate environment uh, creates the need for a policy solution to stop loan? So we're talking about our um, peri-urban um, corridors here, is that what? Uh, just land banks in general. Just a, the relationship oh, between the monetary environment, like the rates being so low. Yeah, well, it, that's been an incredible uh, bonus for land bankers in recent times. It's been record low interest rates which when our land tax system is in such a poor shape these days with uh, loopholes written through them left, right, centre, uh, record low interest rates have also been an absolute uh, boon to uh, land bankers. So, yeah, it would be fascinating to have all this data that we've collected and, uh, you know, have it on a, a public dashboard that everyone could see, you know, how... Uh, um, rising interest rates going to affect land bankers? How um, is that going to affect uh, supply rates, days on market, um, age in stock? You know, there's a whole pile of things there that could be picked up so that um, uh, the consumer could have even half a chance of understanding how the market works compared to these very skilled operators who uh, have millions of dollars uh, uh, on on the line with uh, every stage release uh, underway. Do we have any more questions from the people online here? Yeah. Doesn't look like there's any more questions. So how could community land trust break the land banking problem, asks uh, David Corbett. Well, yeah, community land trusts, you know, it's not going to really solve that problem, but it will um, work as a demonstration that uh, recycling land rents amongst the community um, is uh, so beneficial to a community, you know, I always like the, the stat that during the global financial crisis, um, the foreclosure rate in US CLTs was 94% lower than in the wider market. So that sort of resilience that is possible um, and the sort of common sense of uh, there not being a sort of uh, profiteering off uh, something that's essential um, as housing is the sort of demonstration model of what uh, a wider sort of a land tax system put in, put in place. Um, but, you know, there is potential for CLTs perhaps to be part of a, an inclusionary zoning type model. I'm not super jazzed on inclusionary zoning. I feel like uh, that just means that uh, the cost savings there are thrown onto the rest of the market so that, uh, you know, the, the rest of that master plan community will cover the cost savings given to CLTs. It's not holistic enough, but it's a step in the right direction. Ento, do you want to come up with a, a nice, uh, loud question for us? Feel free to stand over here near the mic. No, I just want to remind the listeners that community land trust, there was something really interesting done in the Whitlam years back in the 1970s before Bill Hayden produced Australia's first economic rationalist budget before they got booted out of office. Whitlam put a lot of money aside um, through the Urban Regional Development Department, and he allocated money to each of the states to the housing commissions who were then allowed to go out and buy huge chunks of land, which were then to be actually put aside, usually on the edges of metropolitan areas, to then be released and developed in the future, very much mimicking, I think, what was still happening in Sweden at the time, um, where local councils were buying up land, usually funded by the federal government in Sweden. So Whitlam tried to do this as well. And the only reason why this sort of um, uh, officer housing, or then it was called the Victorian Housing Commission land banking for the future didn't work out was because from my memory and from the research that was done on it by Leon Sandikoff, there was some corrupt deals done that stuffed it all up. And then of course, Whitlam gets thrown out of office 
So as a consequence, in all the states, they did buy land, the housing commissions, to set it aside for future development for cheaper housing. And that one experiment has never, ever again been pursued. And so as a consequence, we have lost faith in that kind of a drug. Mm. Gee, I'd, I'd love to know the dirt on what happened with Vic Urban um, back during uh, the 2012-13 sort of period. Uh, it might have been Dennis Napthine, Matthew Guy. Some CEO was sent in there, uh, real axe man, and destroyed the culture of the place. And the next thing we know, it was all, all wound up. And there was the Victorian government land banking arm that was uh, torn to shreds in, in next to no time. Uh, if anyone knows uh, the research paper on that or needs a, a dissertation topic, I'd love to um, figure out what happened there because, uh, yeah, non-market solutions, um, they've got to come in play because, uh, you know, we have this huge new challenge coming. We think that housing affordability is a, a, a challenge now. Well, we've got uh, Wall Street sharpening uh, their knives to come in under the build-to-rent phenomenon um, where they've been given 50% land tax deals. And uh, from that, uh, yeah, they're going to be able to um, sit on, on sites to ensure that rents keep increasing. So I can't see much hope uh, with that model. Either. All right, well, we're just about uh, at the end of our time, I think. Um, any last calls on questions? Nothing from here. Seems not. All right. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, yeah, let's hope uh, that uh, by the time we do, uh, let's hope there's more stage release reports and uh, keeps building um, awareness of this issue. I feel like it's going to probably take a couple of these reports before it breaks through into the mainstream consciousness. But, you know, I have been uh, uh, buoyed by uh, the media interest today. And uh, yeah, it's going to continue tomorrow and hopefully for days and months to come because uh, when people really um, get a grip on the fact that uh, you know, the, the basis of our housing affordability policy is, essential, is essentially uh, destined to fail, um, yeah, we've got some hard questions to ask and uh, hopefully we can... Uh, uh, see government reaching out to independent NGOs like Prosper Australia to provide the sort of unique voice that uh, doesn't happen in uh, a room full of lobbyists. All right, well, there you go. Um, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for participating. <laughs>